Welcome back. Let's pick up our discussion of this major derivative. So what is the cardiovascular response to anemia? We can simplify this by changing anemia to hypoxia or the cardiovascular response to decreased oxygen content. What does the body normally do in the setting of hypoxia? If you can appreciate that anemia equals decreased oxygen content, which essentially equals hypoxia, the rest is simple and makes sense. Anemia equals low oxygen content, which equals tissue hypoxia. If the purpose of RBCs are to deliver oxygen, how will oxygen-deprived tissues respond? The answer is vasodilation. Vessels vasodilate in an attempt to deliver oxygen. Tissues need oxygen. So what does vasodilation do to the stroke volume? If you can answer this question, you hit the pot of gold. If you appreciate the notion that decreased oxygen delivery will result in vasodilation, and you think about the cardiac output formula, it is easy to determine how the body will respond to anemia. So if you vasodilate, what happens to afterload? If afterload decreases, what happens to stroke volume? If stroke volume increases, what happens to cardiac output? Finally, if the stroke volume increases, what happens to pulse pressure? The pulse pressure does uh, require a bit of an explanation. Besides calculating pulse pressure as systolic minus diastolic, you can also define pulse pressure as compliance times stroke volume. Compliance comes from the aorta, and although rubbery and elastic, the aorta has fixed compliance. So with increased stroke volume from vasodilation and beta-1 stimulation of the ventricle, the systolic pressure rises out of proportion to diastolic, the aorta has fixed compliance, and thus the pulse pressure rises. Uh, we'll summarize this in the next slide. So here's a summary of what we just reviewed in the previous slide. The cardiac response to anemia includes vasodilation, which leads to decreased afterload. The stroke volume increases due to decreased afterload and also decreased blood viscosity. The cardiac output increases due to stroke volume and the heart rate increases via sympathetic nervous stimulation. The pulse pressure does increase and that is a function of stroke volume times compliance. This is the same situation seen in aortic regurgitation. Volume overload leads to widened pulse pressure. So here we are again with the anemic patient. This is the full catastrophe. We've included the cardiovascular response to anemia, or better stated as the cardiovascular response to decreased oxygen content. Once again, I emphasize, once you learn this stuff, there are only a finite number of ways they can hurt you. Why discuss the kidneys? Because they like this question. Stimulus to erythropoietin secretion, GFR, or anemia. So we have anemia. We have low oxygen content or delivery of oxygen to the kidney. Erythropoietin is stimulated by oxygen content, not GFR. They are dissociated by design. Even the erythropoietin producing cells located in the interstitium are removed from other tubular and glomerular functions. It is the loss of renal mass and these interstitial cells that cause the anemia associated with chronic renal failure. In this example, however, the kidney is working fine. We are addressing the physiologic response to anemia. So how does this work? It's probably low yield, but you have the ubiquitin ligase complex bound to HIF, which is the hypoxia inducible factor. The whole complex is attached to the von Hippel-Landau gene regulator. In the setting of hypoxia, the ubiquitin ligase complex dissociates, which causes HIF to dissociate from the VHL regulator, and ultimately hypoxia-inducible genes stimulate the production of erythropoietin. Please note, erythrocytosis is one of the hallmarks of von Hippel-Landau syndrome, where this gene regulator is mutated and hypoxia-inducible factor is always turned on. So yes, the oxygen content drives erythropoietin production, not the GFR. They are dissociated. This concept also explains the physiologic erythrocytosis seen in patients with chronic lung disease. The chronic hypoxic state stimulates erythropoietin by the kidneys.
We've covered a lot of important material so far. We'll conclude with examples of abnormal oxygen binding in the form of carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobinemia. I cover these in this section as the questions predominantly reflect abnormalities of oxygen content and saturation. Let's start with carboxyhemoglobin. Here we have a normal alveolus with normal oxygen and normal PaO2. That is, there's a normal amount of dissolved oxygen. Now we'll breathe in carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide readily diffuses into the blood. Please note, there is no change in the amount of dissolved oxygen as there is still abundant alveolar oxygen present. Let's move into the red cell. In the red cell, two things to note. Carbon monoxide has an increased affinity for hemoglobin binding. In so doing, it displaces oxygen. So carbon monoxide binds hemoglobin and oxygen is displaced. How does that affect oxygen saturation, which is a measure of oxygen binding to hemoglobin? The oxygen saturation is decreased. Instead of oxygen binding to hemoglobin, carbon monoxide, with its higher affinity, has bound to hemoglobin. So this is the key point. Low oxygen saturations are seen with carbon monoxide poisoning. A spin-off concept is seen in the oxygen dissociation curve. With the higher affinity, the oxygen dissociation curve shifts to the left. The curve shifts as carbon monoxide changes the stoichiometry of hemoglobin binding to oxygen so it is less readily released. And here is the big ticket item. How does carbon monoxide change the oxygen content? We can see there is no change in the amount of hemoglobin, so that doesn't change. The dissolved oxygen remains the same, and it is a small number anyhow. The oxygen content is reduced due to the decrease in oxygen saturation. They love this point, a reduction in oxygen content in the absence of anemia and not due to cardiopulmonary disease. This slide summarizes what we just reviewed. There is an increased affinity for hemoglobin, and the oxygen dissociation curve shifts to the left. In terms of identifying a carbon monoxide question, they will describe an exposure invariably related to working in a closed garage with a heater running. The patient would have been passed out and is bought to the ER by a friend. They may mention the skin color. That is an important point. From the color point of view, carbon monoxide is still a form of oxygen, so the skin will be described as cherry red, not cyanotic. In clinical reality, we would obtain a carboxyhemoglobin level. Occasionally, the NBME will give you that information, but then comes the derivatives. The PaO2, no change. Oxygen saturation is decreased. Oxygen content is decreased as well. That is the footprint of a carboxyhemoglobin question. Okay, let's do the last topic in this section, the binding of oxygen to iron when it is in its oxidized form. So we've seen that oxygen binds to the ferrous atom in the heme group of hemoglobin. But what happens if this gets oxidized to the ferric form? When that occurs, we develop the condition methemoglobinemia. Methemoglobinemia is just that. Ferrous is converted to ferric form of iron. This generally happens following exposure to oxidizing agents in the form of drugs. When ferric is oxidized, there is a consequence. As you can see, oxygen is not bound to hemoglobin. So how is this concept captured by the NBME? Again, they will frame the question around oxygen content. So what happens? There is no change in the amount of hemoglobin. That is, the red cells are still present. There is no change in PaO2 as the amount of dissolved oxygen hasn't changed. It is a reduction in the oxygen saturation that leads to a reduction in the oxygen content. So here's another good case for applied pharmacology. We mentioned that drugs most commonly cause this condition. Chief among those drugs are dapsone. So what is dapsone? It is an antifolate agent. And what does that mean? Whereas humans have a dietary requirement for folate, that is, we can't synthesize folate, bacteria can. They convert paraminobenzoic acid, PABA, into dihydrofolate. Dapsone inhibits this step.
you will see Dapsone mentioned in three conditions. Leprosy, PCP prophylaxis, and dermatitis herpetiformis, abbreviated here as DH. How common are hematologic adverse effects with Dapsone? Greater than 10% is a big deal. In medicine, that is a lot. Not only does it induce methemoglobinemia, but it also causes hemolysis in glucose 6PD deficiency that will be covered in a later section. So they won't tell you the patient has leprosy. Instead, they'll describe the patient with a non-healing skin lesion. A typical question will describe a patient given a drug for non-healing skin lesion. Then they go on to describe some manifestation of methemoglobinemia and expect you to know that that non-healing skin lesion was leprosy. They could do the opposite. Patient with non-healing skin lesion given a drug that caused methemoglobinemia. What was the organism? So here's a summary. Ferric doesn't bind oxygen. It also shifts the oxygen dissociation curve to the left, as with carboxyhemoglobin. They will describe drug exposure, and here are the common agents. Dapsone or sulfa, nitrates, and or topical anesthetics. They may include physical exam features. Unlike carbon monoxide, these patients are dusky or cyanotic. There is no oxygen binding. Coming back to the anesthetic agents, the surgeon may describe chocolate brown blood, obviously seen in the operating room. I've not seen a question phrased this way, but it would be a very excellent setup for the data questions. So what are the data questions? They're going to describe the patient with methemoglobinemia and ask you about the PaO2, which is unchanged. They're going to ask you about the oxygen saturation, which is decreased, and consequently the oxygen content will also be decreased. Clinically, we would obtain a methemoglobin level, and that would be elevated. They can set you up and ask a straightforward question on treatment, that being methylene blue, which reduces iron back to the ferrous state. And just an aside, when discussing nitroprusside, we mentioned cyanide poisoning, whereas thiosulfate is the usual treatment for cyanide poisoning. Do be aware that inducing methemoglobinemia with amyl nitrate can also be part of the treatment regimen as the ferric form of iron binds cyanide. That is just an FYI while we were in the neighborhood. In this two-part section, we presented material that you will be guaranteed to see. It is easy to blow it off, but you'll be rewarded to invest the time. Don't be stubborn. It took me a couple of years to include this in the syllabus, and I'm really glad to cover the material. This stuff is gold. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.